Okay, well, attempt two at today's lecture. Again, I, I'm i sure you find the internet connections just as frustrating as I do. Uh, one of the things that came up in the chat was potential to pre-record all the lectures for you guys to watch ahead of time and use class time for questions and discussion. Let me know, okay? So last time we talked about frames and machines, and we did more free body diagrams. If you recall, you know, so we had if we have a if we have a frame like this, we can break it down into its different elements, draw free body diagrams of those elements. Some of those may be two force elements, some of those are going to be multi-force elements and we can usually find loads and forces at the joints, reaction forces, things like that. Today we're going to dive inside and look at normal forces, shear forces, bending moments, and at the end of the class you should be able to use the method of se sections for determining internal forces in two-dimensional load cases, much like we did with the trusses uh, method of sections. So frames and machines are different as compared to trusses since they have only two force members. Well, trusses have two force members. That's one of the assumptions we made to make the analysis of trusses simpler is that they have only two force members and all the loads are apl applied at the joints. Uh, frames and machines are different because they have only multi-force members. Um, no, because you can have a mix of multi-force and two-force, but they will have C, at least one multi-force member. They may or may not have a two-force member. An additional couple moment is applied at C. So I'm going to apply additional couple moment here. How you change the free body diagram of the member BC at B, so this is the free body diagram of member BC. I'm adding a couple there. How does it change the the free body diagram at at this point right there? B. Member AB is a two-force member, so it is applying a force in this direction and this direction only. So adding this couple is going to change the magnitude of that force, but it's not going to change the direction or type of that force. So I'm going to go with A, still just one force at AB. And we're certainly not going to be adding moments because we're not changing the joint. We're not creating a joint that will give us a reaction moment. If an additional force is applied at D, and I got some ink left over from last time. Now this member here, AB, is no longer a two-force member. It's a multi-force member, so we can no longer assume in our free body diagram that the forces are lined up between the pins, so we have to add additional forces, the x and y components of the forces, because we no longer know the direction of force AB, so my answer, of course, is B. So let's jump into internal forces. Beams are often used to support the span of bridges, and typically on a bridge we would have, you know, distributed loading on the bridge. Um, and that means that the forces inside that beam change from end to end. You know, if you've ever broken a stick, you try to break it in the middle because that's where it's easiest to break. Um, this is slightly different, you know, depending on how it's, it's constrained and mounted, you'll taper it one way or the other. Um, but for a bridge like this, the beam can be thicker at the ends and thinner in the middle to save materials, uh, but you need to know the forces at each point along the way. Something like this billboard, it's thicker at the bottom because the loads from wind and weight 
are going to have more leverage down here at the bottom, and that's where the internal forces are the highest. Again, you know, we need to come up with a way to decide how thick and large those tubes need to be. So we need to know the forces inside those tubes and how those forces vary along the tube to make sure we've got the right material. So designing structural members requires finding the forces acting within the members. So we got to find the forces inside the member. Previously we had found forces here here and here, the reaction forces, but what's happening inside right there? How do we find those? Well, we do a virtual split, and now, just like in a truss, we now can find we have a force upwards here, so obviously there has to be a force downwards there to maintain the sum of forces equal to it's some of some of the forces in the y direction for that to be zero we have to have a a downward force to maintain that but that creates a moment so we're going to have to have a reaction moment there to support that end to maintain equilibrium on that internal part but in by cutting this into virtual sections we can expose those forces and use our equations of equilibrium to solve for those forces just like I drew, we find the forces acting inside the members. We have a force lined up with the, with the beam. This is the normal. We call that the normal force. This is the shear. And we have typically some reaction moment required, and we call that the bending moment. But all of those forces are the forces inside the beam that we're applying right here to keep it in equilibrium, that subsection. So again, you know, method of sections, just like we did with trusses, we cut it apart. Uh, typically we'll find the support reactions ahead of time. We'll cut the beam at point B and we will solve for internal forces on one half or the other or both using the equations of equilibrium. So there's our free body diagram. There's the section cut away and then so we can solve the e equations of equilibrium for this particular section. As I mentioned before we have names for these internal forces the normal force N acting perpendicular to section or along the length of that perpendicular to the section along the length of the beam, but it's normal to the section. Okay, so when I cut that section there, it is normal to that perpendicular. Uh, shear forces act along the surface, and the bending moment is the reaction moment or reaction couple necessary to keep that in equilibrium. And of course when I cut these the loads on the left and right have to be equal and opposite, right? So if I have a shear force downward here to keep that from rotating um, Newton's laws, right? We have to have an equal and opposite force applied to the right hand side to keep that in equilibrium. So I end up with one pointing down and one pointing up, right? I add a, have a, a bending moment in one direction here, bending moment in the other direction there, and the normal forces, um, you know, it's, since this is drawn in tension, but it's drawn in tension, but we have the forces acting in opposite direction. So if I were to ask you what is the sign of that force, and B. What is the sign of that force? Is it positive or negative? You know, we can't say, well, it depends on which side you're looking at it. When we need, want to know the forces inside the material, we need to know the sign of that force so we can do the math. So we have to have, we need a convention, right? So here is our convention. A positive normal force 
is when the beam is loaded in tension. And if you remember when we talked about trusses, I always said just draw it in tension and assume that that force is positive. That's the reason why. So that would be consistent with this here. The tension is positive and we can draw it when we draw free body diagrams. Draw it tension. Assume that's positive. And if you get a negative number, you know it's in compression. Shear is a little more complicated. A positive shear tends to rotate the object clockwise. Okay, so this, you know, this section is going to try and rotate clockwise. This section is going to try to rotate clockwise. That's backwards from our previous two-dimensional convention. So be careful, are we talking about moments in general or are we talking about the effect of shear, okay? So if it causes a clockwise rotation, then we assume that that is a positive shear and it makes the math work. And for bending, if it's trying to bend this object like this, okay, that is a positive bending moment. And expect on the next exam to get a picture very much like this. And I'm going to ask you to draw in the forces in the positive direction just to make sure you've got that straight in your head and to help you with the exam. So let's run an example. Given the loading on the beam, find the internal forces at point C. What's our first step here? Did I hear somebody say draw the free body diagram? Yes, you did. Or yes, I did. I hope I did. So I'm going to want to find the internal forces at C. So I'm going to cut a virtual section there. So I'm going to have two free body diagrams. At B, I could have a force here and a force in this direction. And I am going to draw a positive normal force, a positive shear force, and a positive bending moment. And I have a free body diagram for the other side. I have potentially a force there. I have a positive NC, positive VC, and positive moment at C. Okay, equal and opposite. And I have a distributed force along there. And I have a bunch of dimensions and stuff that I need to draw as well. So our first step, having done our free body diagrams, is to decide which side is going to be easier. I'm guessing myself that it's probably easier to work with this one right here, though we do need to solve for for this FB, that's an unknown. So we're going to have to do a little bit of work, so we're going to have to take a step backwards to do that. But once we have that force, uh, the rest should be falling off a log. Now why people want to fall off a log, I don't know, but, but that's the nature of the situation. So to find that reaction force, I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the whole thing. Um, I've got a, I'm just going to draw it on top of this for the sake of expediency. And I can assume that this will be a concentrated force at three feet from A, and it's three kilopounds per foot times six feet, that's 18 kilopounds. And it's pounds, so I don't need to convert it from the force of gravity. If, it had, if I'd given you slugs, we'd have to convert, or if I'd given you 
kilograms you have to convert. Okay. By inspection, bx equals zero. I only care about by because I'm only going to look at that piece of the puzzle right there. So who cares what's happening at A? Let's get A out of our equation. So I'm going to say, let's do the sum of forces, sum of the moments about A equal to zero. So it's in equilibrium. That eliminates the force at A from my equation. That is equal to, I have 18 kilopounds down and to the left. That's counterclockwise. We're looking at reaction forces, so we're using our conventional counterclockwise, clockwise. Counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative sign convention. So that's negative 18 times 3. And I have, the way I have it drawn, I have, that's also counterclockwise minus by times 9, and that gives me a by is equal to negative 6 kips, kilopounds. Now I have what I need to draw my free body diagram on the right hand side, and let's go to a clean slide to do that. So we said that this was negative 6 kilopounds to, okay, so I'm going to draw my free body diagram of the right hand side. This is B, this is C. I'm going to draw my force downward here because I'm starting a new free body diagram and I know that and I'm just content to do that. I'm going to draw a positive shear force, trying to rotate it clockwise. I'm going to draw a positive normal force, putting it in tension. And I'm going to draw a positive bending moment. So that's VC, MC, and NC. And this is my beam. Let's draw it like that. We, again, we have to be real careful with signs. Okay. So now I can find, since I drew all of these on the left in the positive direction, you know, if I get a negative number, then I know it's a negative value. So let's, let's do our equations of equilibrium. Some of the forces x equal, equal to zero. Um, that tells us that NC, so NC is equal to zero. <coughs> we could have done that by inspection. Sum of the forces Y equals zero. That's equal to a minus six kilopounds plus VC. And Again, be very careful about your signs. And are we talking about the sign convention internally or externally? So that tells me that, that VC is equal to the shear force at point C is equal to 6 kilopounds. And it's upward, just like the way we drew it. <clears throat> and now I need to do sum of moments somewhere. The so if I did it about some of the moments about B, then I'd have to include VC and things into that. So let's not do that. Let's do the sum of the moments about point C equal to zero. And that is equal to, I've got my MC, right, which I drew positive for internal forces. But now since we're finding we're working with equations of equilibrium. We'll use our clockwise, counterclockwise rotation convention. So that's a negative MC, and I'm sure that's a little bit confusing. But in our 
sign conventions for the equilibrium that we it is clockwise and that makes it negative and we have our, our minus six kilopounds times the 4.5 feet and that is negative because it is clockwise again so I end up with MC equal to minus 27 foot kilopounds. So that means that our moment here is counterclockwise or opposite of the way we drew it. So if I draw that moment in the direction that it actually applies, and this is our beam, it is counterclockwise, which is positive in our convention for external forces, it's negative in our convention for internal forces. Now, I could have done the left hand side there, I just drawn the free body diagram, and in this case our shear force is pointed downward, which is a positive convention for internal forces, but in our equations of equilibrium it would be a negative number because it's, you know, we'd be pointing downward, okay? Our steps for analysis, we take an imaginary or virtual cut at the point you need to determine the forces, decide which side is easier, uh, determine any support reactions or joint forces you need. When we did this one here, when we picked the left, we only had to find the support reactions at B. We didn't need the support reactions at A. Make our life simple. and that often involves a free body diagram of the entire structure. Draw free body diagrams of each piece you've decided to analyze. Remember to show all three of these. So again, we want to draw our moment, shear, and normal forces in the positive direction for that cut so that when we do the analysis, if we get negative numbers, we know that they're negative forces. If we draw it negative and then we get a positive number while well, it's really negative and if we get a negative number it's really positive and my personal recommendation is just draw them positive and then that eliminates confusion. Apply the equations of equilibrium to this free body diagram and solve for the unknown internal loads. At that point, at this point, that should be pretty trivial for you guys. So let's run another example. So let's let's run an example here. I, I'm going to look at my two two sides. So this is point B and this is point F. I've got a distributed load. I've got a tension T. I've got my positive shear force. I got my positive normal force. And I've got my positive moment at F. And on the left hand side, I've got a y, a x, I have my tension, I've got my distributed load, which is going to result in some load there. I've got the positive normal force, positive shear force. and my positive moment right there. Okay, so looking at this, the right-hand side looks easier to solve to me. So to solve that, I need to find that unknown tension. So for that, I'm going to have to look at the whole thing, and I'm just going to cheat a little bit here and just draw these on here for our free for our free body diagram for the whole thing. That's T, that's T. This resolves into a single force here which is equal to 300 times 6 newton meters equals 1800 newtons. Since I only care about T, if I do the sum of the moments about point A, 
and I'm going to kind of write this vertically. So that is equal to, I have the tension at 6 meters. That is counterclockwise. That's positive. So that's T times 6. And I have also positive from the force D. I have at D, the tension at D, I have the vertical component of that is T times the sine of 45 times 3. And I have minus 1800 times 3 for the applied load. And that gives me, solving that, I get T equals to 665 newtons. Okay, so that lets us now look at just the right-hand side. So if I draw my free body diagram for the right-hand side, I have 665 newtons there. I have a distributed force. I have my, this is F, I have VF, I have NF, and I have moment at F, bending moment at F, all drawn positive. If I do the, so if I do some of the forces x equals zero, I end up with our normal force equal to zero. If I do some of the forces y equals zero, well, I need to replace this distributed load with a single, um, single load that's 300 newtons per meter times 3 meters, so that's 450 newtons. So some of the forces y equals zero, I have my Vf is positive, plus 665 is positive, minus 450. So I get my Vf equals minus 215. So I know it's downward and it's a negative internal force, or internal, yeah. And I can do the sum of the moments about my section is almost always the easier way to do it because then I don't have to, or I should say it's not necessarily the easiest, but it's less likely to give you a mistake because you don't, because if you made a mistake in your shear force, you know, that mistake will carry into your moment calculation. If we do the moments about the section, any mistake in the shear force doesn't carry into there. So the sum moments about F equals zero, that is equal to my moment as drawn for our reaction is a negative MF. We have a negative, because it's clockwise, 450 times 0.75 meters. And we have a positive 665 times 1.5 meters. And I get my moment at F there equal to 660 newton meters. Internal forces at point C. Again, we're going to cut it in half. We're going to look at the forces. We're going to pick a side. If we assume that point A is pinned and B is a roller, then that B there is only an up. At A there is forces potentially there and there. I'm going to pick the right-hand side because this, I think, is easier. So I don't have to deal with the triangle. Not that much different, but, you know, what the heck. So that means I need the reaction force at B. So if I do, so if I do some of the moments about A equals zero, I've got 
by times 6 meters. I've got minus 1 half, and it's 6 kilonewtons per meter. 1 half base is 3 meters times height is 6 times 3, 1 half base times height, actually height times base, times the center of that triangle is 2 thirds of that triangle over is, is two, 2 meters. So that is the moment from the triangle. And then it's clockwise, so it's negative. And we have minus uh, the center of that, tri of that square is at 4.5. Well, the, the 6 kilonewtons per meter times 3 meters times 4.5 meters from A for the center. Okay, and I get my B Y equals 16.5 newtons. Okay, kind of shortcutted it there just for expediency because it's the kind of thing we should have been doing over and over. And so if I draw my free body diagram of the right hand side, I've got my force at B, which we said was 16.5 newtons. We have the equivalent force of that rectangle sitting in the middle there, and that is 18 kilonewtons. 6 times 3. And I have at point C, I'm going to draw my positive shear, my positive normal force, which by inspection I can see is equal to zero, and my positive bending moment at C. So I'll say that NC equals zero by inspection. We could do some of the forces X. Some of the forces Y equals zero. That gives me Vc minus 18 kilonewtons for our distributed load plus 16.5 newtons for my reaction force at B. So Vc equals, these are kilonewtons, okay, sorry. Vc equals 1.50 kilonewtons. And I will do some of the moments about my section equals zero. Again, I will do it about the section because that's the easier place to do it, or less error prone. Gives me my 16.5 from at force at B. It's positive because it's counterclockwise, 16.5, and that is times three meters. And my distributed force 18 kilonewtons is got my distributive force is going to give me a negative because it's clockwise 18 newtons times 1.5 meters and my MC the way I've drawn it it's positive for an internal moment but in our external convention it's clockwise so it's minus MC and I can solve that for if I did the math correctly MC equals my MC is 22.5 newton meters or kilonewton meters And that's positive, so it's in the direction drawn. Let's look at another point, at point D, okay? Now, from the last example, we determined that the reaction force here was 16.5 kilonewtons. And we want to find the forces at point D. And again, it's going to be easier to draw this left side, especially since we already have that reaction force. So let's go to the next slide. So now I have my 
16.5 kilonewtons there. I have, because I have 1.5 meters times 6 kilonewtons per meter, I have a force here of 9 kilonewtons. And it's 0.75 meters from point D. I have my positive shear, VD, my normal ND, and my positively drawn MD. So I, again, I know that ND, my normal force is equal to zero. Sum of the forces Y equals zero. I've got the shear force at D minus 9 kilonewtons plus 16.5 kilonewtons. So my shear force at D equals minus 7.5 kilonewtons. Last time we did, we got what? At C, it was a plus 1.5 kilonewtons. Now we've gotten a negative 7.5 kilonewtons. Okay, so obviously we've changed there. Just VC was equal to plus 1.5, just as a note. And I can do the sum of the moments about D equals 0. And I've got, again, minus MD minus 9 times 7, 0.75 plus 16.5, that number hasn't changed, times 1.5, that number has changed since the last example, and I get my MD is now 18 kilonewton meters. And for reference, my moment at C was equal to 22.5 kilonewton meters, just for reference, okay? So as we move along that beam, we change the internal forces, the moments are changing, the shear forces are change, changing. In this case, the normal force is zero, but potentially that could change as well. Okay, that wraps up this lecture. I will have this uploaded and we will discuss how we want to do things next Tuesday.